नमस्कार वॉम वेलकम टू वर्ल्ड न्यूज एंड इंडियन पर्सपेक्टिव ऑन ऑल इंडिया रेडियो दिस इज आर एस रघु एंड विद मी इज रेणुका ब्रिंगिंग ग्लिम्सेस ऑफ द मेजर डेवलपमेंट्स ऑफ द डे फ्रॉम अक्रॉस द ग्लोब ओवर द नेक्स्ट हाफ एन आवर वी शैल ब्रिंग यू द लेटेस्ट फ्रॉम द वर्ल्ड ऑफ पॉलिटिक्स इकोनॉमी स्पोर्ट्स एंटरटेनमेंट एंड मोर दी हेडलाइंस इंडियन डिफेंस मिनिस्टर राजनाथ सिंह रीच एस कायरो ऑन संडे ऑन रूट इजिप्ट फॉर अ टू डे विजिट state funeral of britain's longest serving monarch queen elizabeth ii to take place on coming monday in london president draupadi murmu offers tribute to departed soul at westminster abbey external affairs minister of india dr s j shankar leaves for 11 day visit to united states on sunday for unga session China issues the advisory to its citizens to avoid foreigners after the first monkeypox case was detected on Friday. Super typhoon Nan Madol, the deadliest typhoon of the decade, hit Japan on Sunday night. Tsunami warnings issued after 6.8 magnitude earthquake hits Taiwan on Sunday. And in women's cricket, India won by 7 wickets. in first odi of three match series in hove against england prime minister narendra modi unveiled the national logistics policy on saturday at a function in new delhi he said the policy is aimed at bringing down the cost of transportation of industrial products to a single digit and the time consumed Mr Modi said the policy is a significant step in the direction of India becoming a developed country. The Prime Minister said the national logistics policy will prevent damage to agricultural products by providing faster transportation. He said various road projects such as Bharat Mala and Sagar Mala were launched by him after becoming the Prime Minister to improve connectivity. He said speeding up the work of the dedicated freight corridor is also a move in that direction. The Prime Minister said the unified logistics interface platform will bring all digital services related to the transportation sector into a single portal freeing the exporters from a host of very long and cumbersome processes similarly under the policy a new digital platform ease of logistics services has also been started in today's hotspot section we bring you a discussion on national logistics policy in conversation are sharad kohli economic analyst and sonu sood air correspondent this is all india radio in the program spotlight now we bring you a discussion on national logistics policy the participants are sharad kohli economic analyst and sonu sood air correspondent Rolling out the national logistics policy on Saturday, Prime Minister Narendra Modi said this is a significant step in the direction of India becoming a developed country. Sharad ji, can you tell us about the importance of logistics in our economic landscape and what is the significance and primary objective of national logistics policy launched by the Prime Minister? If India is aiming at being a global economic superpower we remember the five fronts which uh, prime minister took from the ramparts of red fort on 15th of august one of the first fronts was that india aiming at becoming a developed economy for a developed economy it's important that your economic might your economic prowess should come to the fore for which logistics plays a very important part because if india wants to gain on exports remain as an importer of certain vital goods india wants to promote its domestic trade logistics play a very significant role from where this policy emanated and prime minister was very clear in saying that this is not come out of the blue this has been part of concerted efforts over the last 8 years when the various departments of the government have been trying to put their coordination put their efforts together to see that a comprehensive logistic policy comes on the table and where this emanated from if we look at that our transportation cost right now on an average is about 13 to 15% whereas if you look at some of the other parts of the world the cost is about 8 to 10% so we are ahead and sometimes when you are trading internationally when you are in the business of supplying goods internationally we should not forget that the margins are very thin and it's a very price sensitive market across the world so it may seem that probably difference between 8 to 10% and 13 to 14% may be about let's say 3 to 5% but factually speaking 
this is a lot of difference and this was the main goal where the government has been making concerted efforts to make sure that this particular cost comes down to make our goods more competitive to ensure seamless movement of goods national logistic policy nlp as we call it has been framed that is first is to reduce the cost to understand in very simple terms reduce the cost and second is to reduce the time because time is of essence in international trade if i want the goods today and if i get them let's say 3 days after either i may lose the relevance of the goods or in case of agri commodities in case of food related stuff the goods may have to be thrown apart from the country losing its credibility in international trade it was also a huge loss for the entire supply chain which was involved in moving those goods so i think this is aimed at as i said a two fold objective seamless movement of goods to cut down the time and bring down the cost now the billion dollar question is that how do you bring down the cost and the best way you could do it is if you look at the infrastructure the gati shakti the national master plan for infrastructure a few months ago which was launched and a perfect coordination between various ministries to ensure that infrastructure projects move forward so we've seen the result we've seen this in bharat mala we've seen this in sagar mala we've seen this in the dedicated freight corridors which have been made today the time taken for a lorry or a truck to move across the country is much lesser because you don't have those long waiting check posts or octroi posts we've got fast tags and very important task that sonu i would like to point out here is that the container turnaround time which is very important in international trade because the time it takes for a container to enter the port and the time it takes for it to be on boarded the ship the whole logistic process that has drastically come down it used to be i remember 44 hours a few years ago it has now gradually come down to 26 hours and this is where it matters and i think it's a very welcome step and i'm sure the entire business community the entire transport community are going to be the end beneficiaries of this nlp i would say so In fact the PM said yesterday that our cargo should be run as fast as the cheetah still improving the first and last mile connectivity speeding up cargo movement through integrated digital data systems make our industry much more competitive at the domestic and global level as you said not only help our exports but also help bring down prices maybe for the domestic consumers as well If you see the initiatives launched we today have a multimodal transport system gone are the days when we were only looking at the railways today the roads are as good as the railway speed or the railway cost and if we look at some of the initiatives launched by the government there is something uh, called e sanchit now e sanchit is about promoting paperless import and export procedures i think this paperless import and export processes by way of e sanchit has played a big role in reducing the time then the faceless assessment in the customs just the way it has been done for income tax likewise there is a faceless assessment system launched in customs also that has again reduced the time involved in clearance of the customs uh, and the consignments and turns then as i said e way bill fast tax have played the role then another very important thing which i would like to mention here solo is we know ulip as a unit claim insurance plan but here is a new ulip which is part of the logistic policy which is called the united logistics interface platform now this is integrating all the logistic digital platform together into a single portal so you don't have to visit a million portals for doing this doing that just go to one single integrated portal to sort out all your logistic related compliances all your logistic related questions all your logistic related issues so i think ulip has played a big role another important thing which has been done sonu and it is worth mentioning and i'm sure our all the radio listeners would be very heartened to listen to this there's something called e logs now e logs is e hyphen l o g s this means ease of logistic services now what has been done under e logs is that the various industries association be it steel be it food grains be it plastics any manufacturing or industrial sector they can as an industrial association come together log in their grievances if they've got any problem with any issues relating to any government department any port any airport they can lodge their complaints they can resolve their issues through e logs this is one of those brilliant initiatives i would say because there were industry associations running from pillar to post to see how to resolve this problem suppose there was a policy related issue or there was a movement related issue or there was a cost related issue or there was a clearance related issue or there was a compliance related issue all these issues can now be resolved through e logs which is again a very welcome step and we should not forget here that to a certain extent logistics is a state subject also each state must have its own logistic policy in this connection the policy also makes way for a framework to set up multimodal logistics parks 
as you said, that where the states have to be involved, aimed at seamless integration of various modes of transport, and also a framework for accelerated development of advanced technology enabled warehousing. How important are these elements of national logistics policy? When you talk of multimodal transport, traditionally we were referring only to the railways or if there was an urgent delivery of goods, probably flying the goods or referring to the air mode of transporting the goods. But I think the newest tradition has been, which is very noticeable, is waterways. Because waterways, if we go to countries like Europe, you would find that there is a place in Italy called Venice where there are no roads. Everything happens through waterways. You take a taxi on water. You move the goods on water. So I think building waterways and to connect rail, road and waterways together so the goods can seamlessly move from a road to a waterway, from waterways onboarded to a railway or vice versa. I think this multimodal transport by way of cooperation from the states has been very significant. And as you refer to about the technology, which is particularly used in warehousing, because perishable goods were the ones which were suffering the biggest of losses because of lack of infrastructure and technology on the storage, on warehousing. This is particular in case of food and medicinal, because India being pharmacy of the world, the pharmaceutical products which require certain degree of temperature to be maintained, air conditioning, I think technology being brought in there, most modern infrastructure being brought in there, has made our food processing and pharmaceutical industry today very, very competitive around the world. And while I refer to the states, I have to mention that, as I said, constitutionally speaking, this is also a state subject. So we've seen so many states who've already come up with draft logistic policy. I'm referring to Assam, I'm referring to Chhattisgarh, I'm referring to Gujarat, Haryana, Himachal Pradesh, Kerala, Andhra Pradesh, Madhya Pradesh, Mizoram, Rajasthan. So many states have already come up with draft policy. And to the best of my information, Sonu, there are at least 13 more states which are in the process of drafting the logistic policy. So here is what we are heading for. Once all the states have finalized their draft policy, once all the remaining states have come out with a draft policy, and once everything is finalized, you will see this at one country. I would say national logistic policy as one country. So whether you're moving from Gujarat to Maharashtra, from Maharashtra to Madhya Pradesh, from Madhya Pradesh to Karnataka or any place for that matter, I think the businessmen, the whole supply chain will not feel the difference. You can actually move the goods, not realizing that you move from one state to the other. And I think right. that is what was required. And it has really, really helped the industry. And I think our dream of 5 trillion economy and probably by 2030 are overtaking China in terms of the second biggest economy in the world. We are already now fifth and I'm hoping that we should be able to overtake or at least compete with China. I think that dream is no more a dream. It is going to become a reality thanks to this national logistics policy, Sono. Let's not forget, is about coordination. Logistic cannot happen unless all the departments involved, all the states involved, all the infrastructure involved move ahead in a coordinated manner because otherwise logistics cannot work. In fact, if you go into the definition of the word logistics, if you dig deep into it, you will find coordination is the magic word. So that is what we are witnessing. And I'm sure as we move forward, this is going to be a driving engine. I would say this would be a force to drive the country forward to becoming a developed economy. Sharaji, as we all know that our country is a very diversified country geographically and Prime Minister has been regularly lauding that we are into production by masses. So we have small scale producers also, be it in the manufacturing, be it in the export oriented or be it in the agriculture sector. You feel that this national logistics policy will also make things easier for these small businessmen or small entrepreneurs? So no, over 95% of our businesses, they are part of MSMEs, the micro, small and medium enterprises, as you said. And without taking care of the interest of these small enterprises, I'm sure no national logistic policy can be a success. So therefore, enough has been provided to make sure that the smaller enterprises, the smaller businesses, the small farmers, the small producers, their interests are taken care of. And I can mention an example. If today I have to export, let's say, five kilos of something, I know a truck cannot do it. No truck is going to accept a five kilo consignment. So I have seen by use of technology, a lot of these technology startups which are into logistics, they now take a booking. So what they do is they club the consignments together. Whereas traditionally how this clubbing used to happen is that you used to go to a transporter, let your goods lie there, and the transporter used to say, sir, you'll have to wait till I get another booking. Now, because of integration of technology into logistics through these startups and other means, 
I think today you can go online, make a booking. The transporter need not wait because he constantly gets requests for these small size consignments. So I think the smaller size consignments will be the most benefited from this national logistics policy because through technology, through an integrated effort, through a concerted effort, through a coordinated effort, I think they will be able to promote their cause. They will be able to go places, as they say in English, that you can take your small produce to a remote corner of the world thanks to the national logistics policy, Sonu. Sharaji, thank you so much for shedding light on various crucial aspects of the national logistics policy and telling us how it will be a game changer for enhancing ease of moving and hence ease of doing business and ease of living in our country. Thank you. Thank you very much. This program was produced and presented by the News Services Division of All India Radio. You can listen to it on our mobile app, News on AIR. This program is also available on our YouTube channel, News on AIR Official. You may email your opinion about this program at airnsttalks at gmail.com. Defence Minister Rajnath Singh reached Cairo on Sunday on a two-day official visit to Egypt. Central Military Zone Commander Major General Tariq Hamed El Shazli received Mr. Singh at the Al Maza Air Base in Cairo. During the visit, Mr. Singh will hold bilateral talks with Minister of Defence and Defence Production General Mohammad Zaki. The two ministers will review the bilateral defence ties, explore new initiatives to intensify military to military engagements, and focus on deepening cooperation between the defence industries of the two countries. An MOU to provide further impetus to enhance defence cooperation between India and Egypt will also be signed. Mr. Singh will also call on President of Egypt, Abdel Fattah al-Sisi. This is All India Radio giving you the world news. For quick news updates around the clock, follow us on our Twitter handle at AIR News Alerts. Welcome back to World News. State funeral of Britain's longest serving monarch, Queen Elizabeth II will take place tomorrow at Westminster Abbey in London. The funeral ceremony will begin at 3.30pm Indian time. Westminster Abbey is a 753-year-old church where royals have traditionally been married, mourned and buried. On Wednesday, the coffin was taken by horse-drawn gun carriage to the Houses of Parliament where it lay in state for four days. Prior to this, the coffin was at London's Buckingham Palace where thousands of people were allowed to bid farewell to the United Kingdom's longest-serving monarch. The Queen's body was brought to London from Balmoral in Scotland where she passed away on the 8th of this month at the age of 96. Following her death, processions and rituals were conducted in Balmoral before the body was brought to London. President Draupadi Murmu visited Westminster Hall today where the body of Queen Elizabeth II is lying in state. Ms. Murmu offered tributes to the departed soul on her behalf and on behalf of the people of India. She also signed the condolence book. President Draupadi Murmu reached London this morning to attend the state funeral of Her Majesty. The former head of state of the UK, Queen Elizabeth II, was also the head of Commonwealth of Nations. External Affairs Minister Dr. S. J. Shankar is on a 11-day visit to the United States beginning on Sunday, September 18th to attend the UN General Assembly and participate in meetings of Quad, BRICS and several other key groupings. On the first leg of his tour in New York, he will lead the Indian delegation for the high-level week at the General Assembly. Dr. Jayashankar will address the high-level session of the UN General Assembly on 24th of September. The theme of the 77th UNGA is a watershed moment, transformative solutions to interlocking challenges. In keeping with India's strong commitment to reformed multilateralism, Dr. Jayashankar will hold a ministerial meeting of the G4 India Brazil, Japan, Germany and also participate in the high-level meeting of the L69 group on reinvigorating multilateralism and achieving comprehensive reform of the UN Security Council. Dr. Jashankar will visit Washington, D.C. from 25th to 28th of September for bilateral meetings with U.S. interlocutors. The Chinese Center for Disease Control and Prevention, CDC, has warned citizens not to touch foreigners after the first monkeypox case was detected on Friday in the southwestern city of Chongqing in China. The infection was detected on Friday in an individual 
who arrived from abroad, China's first known monkeypox infection, amid the recent global outbreak of the virus. Local authorities said the transmission risk was low as the individual was put in quarantine upon arrival in Chongqing as per COVID-19 protocol and all close contacts were isolated and put under medical observation. Wu Zunyu, CDC's chief epidemiologist, published the recommendations on China's Twitter-like platform Weibo on Saturday advising the public on the do's and the don'ts. Super Typhoon Nanmadol made landfall in southwestern Japan tonight. The massive storm was packing fierce gusts and torrential rain. Due to its vast scale impacts, this has been termed as one of the most deadliest typhoons in the recent decades in Japan. According to the Japan Meteorological Agency, the storm's eyewall approached Kagoshima City at around 7 p.m. local time, marking the storm's official landfall. Parts of the southwestern Kyushu region have received up to 500 mm of rain in less than 24 hours, and the storm was packing gusts of up to 234 km per hour. At least 20,000 people were spending the night in shelters in Kyushu's Kagoshima and Miyazaki prefectures where the JMA had issued a rare special warning. Union Minister Dr. Jitendra Singh will lead the joint Indian Ministerial Delegation of Power, New and Renewable Energy and Science and Technology to America to take part in the Global Clean Energy Action Forum. Dr. Singh will leave for Washington on Monday evening for the first leg of the American tour and from there he will proceed to Pittsburgh and later to New York. He will be on a five-day visit to participate in the joint convening of Clean Energy Ministerial and Mission Innovation from 21st to 23rd of September 2022 at Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, United States of America. Commerce and Industry Minister Piyush Goel will be on a two-day visit to Saudi Arabia beginning Sunday. He will co-chair the inaugural ministerial meeting of the Economic and Investments Committee with Saudi Arabia's Energy Minister Prince Abdul Aziz bin Salman. The two ministers are expected to discuss the progress made under various joint working groups of the Economic and Investment Committee. Both sides are also expected to formulate plan of action for further strengthening bilateral cooperation in priority areas and projects including the West Coast Refinery Project and Trans-Ocean Grid Connectivity. They will also draft plan of action over accelerate progress on the announcement made by Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman of investments worth 100 billion US dollar in India during his visit to India in February 2019. The World Bank Vice President for the South Asia region SAR SAR, Martin Razor will arrive in Dhaka on Monday, 19 September. During his first visit to the country, Mr. Razor will meet with Bangladesh Finance Minister and senior government officials to discuss World Bank support to address the country's development priorities, said a press release issued by the World Bank on Sunday. He will also meet with development partners, leaders from the private sector, civil society and think tanks. The World Bank was among the first development partners to support Bangladesh following its independence. The World Bank is the biggest contributor to Bangladesh within the multilateral debt category. Its concessional IDA finance constituted 55% of the total debt in the multilateral debt category, while Asian Development Bank constituted 39% of the total multilateral debt to Bangladesh. On the first anniversary of girls being banned from attending high schools in Afghanistan, the UN renewed its call that the Taliban immediately reopen high schools for everyone. Last year on the same day, September 18th, high schools reopened to boys while the Taliban ordered girls to stay at home. The Islamic Emirate had said earlier that they are working on a mechanism to pave the way for reopening of girls' schools. However, the final decision has yet to be announced. The closure of schools for female students in grades 7 to 12 by the Islamic Emirate has faced reactions at the national and international level. A strong earthquake of 6.8 magnitude shook Taiwan on Sunday as a series of aftersh aftershocks hit the self-governing island of China's east coast. According to the Taiwanese authorities, the quake... The quake struck at a relatively shallow depth of 7 kilometers near the city of Taitung on the southeastern coast. Following the quake in Taiwan, Japan Meteorological Agency issued an advisory for a tsunami as high as one meter, reaching several southern Japanese islands. The agency said the earliest waves could reach the Yonaguni Island, Japan's watermost island, westernmost island about 110 kilometers east of Taiwan at around 4.10 p.m. on Sunday and subsequently three nearby islands. 
The islands are about 2,000 kilometers south west of Tokyo. Weather officials urge residents in those areas to stay away from the coastline. Taiwan's Taitung County was hit by a 6.4 earthquake on Saturday night and has been rattled by numerous aftershocks since then. At least 17 people have been killed in landslides triggered by heavy rain in western Nepal. The landslide occurred in different parts of the Acham district of Sudar Pashim province, which has been badly affected by floods caused by incessant rainfall for the last few days. Eleven people who sustained injuries in the incidents were airlifted to the Sirkhet district for treatment. Three persons are also missing following the landslides. Nepal police personnel have been mobilized and rescue work is on to search for the missing persons. Indian javelin thrower Devendra Jhajharia has claimed a silver medal in the World Para-Athletics Grand Prix in Morocco. Paralympics gold medalist Devendra threw the javelin to a distance of 60.97 meter to capture the silver. Devendra is a three-time Paralympics medalist. In women's cricket, India beat England by seven wickets in the first one-day international match of three-match ODI series at County Ground in Hove, England. India take a one nil lead in the three-match series. Chasing a target of 228 runs set by England, India made 232 for the loss of three wickets in the 44.2 overs. Batting first, England women scored 227 runs in 50 overs for the loss of seven wickets. For India, Smriti Mandana was the top scorer with 91 runs, while skipper Harman Preet Kaur scored unbeaten 74 runs. Smriti Mandana was declared player of the match. Earlier, India had won the toss and elected to bowl first. Before the series, England women had won the three-match T20 international series against India women by 2-1. Now let us take a look at the major developments around the world as reported in the foreign press. The Washington Post reports millions urged to shelter as typhoon Nanmadol bears down on Japan. The Guardian writes building collapses after strongest in series of earthquake shakes Taiwan. South China Morning Post report says Pelosi condemns Azerbaijan illegal attacks on Armenia during visit to the Russian ally. The Financial Times writes Trump's back fails to pay proxy firm despite tough hunt for votes. The Japan Times write powerful typhoon makes landfall in southern Japan as thousands take shelter. The Wall Street Journal write Russia expands attack on civilian targets in Ukraine after battlefield losses. And now a quick look at the headlines once again. Indian Defence Minister Rajnath Singh reaches Cairo on Sunday en route to Egypt for a two-day visit. State funeral of Britain's longest-serving monarch, Queen Elizabeth II, to take place on coming Monday in London. President Draupadi Murmu offers tribute to departed soul at Westminster Abbey. External Affairs Minister of India Dr. S. J. Shankar leaves for a 11-day visit to United States on Sunday for UNGA session. China issues the advisory to its citizens to avoid foreigners after the first monkeypox case was detected on Friday. Super Typhoon Nan Madol, the deadliest typhoon of the decade, hit Japan on Sunday night. Tsunami warnings issued after 6.8 magnitude earthquake hits Taiwan on Sunday. And in women's cricket match between India and England, in India won by 7 wickets. And now before we end, let us listen to Mahatma Gandhi's favorite bhajan Vaishnav Jan by artists from St. Kitts and Nevis. Nava Janato, Kini Kaiche, Pieda Parai, Jani Re, Vish Nava Janato, Kini Kaiche, Pieda Parai, Jani Re. And with that, we end this bulletin. We'll be back at the same time tomorrow with the next edition of World News. Thank you.